Welcome to the Yours in Marketing podcast. On this episode, I spoke with AJ Wilcox, who is a LinkedIn ads wizard. He's also a public speaker. He's a writer. Even though he doesn't like writing as much, he's also the founder of B2 Linked, which is a LinkedIn ads only agency. And it kind of helps you get your feet wet with ads and then scale it up. He's also an author at Lynda and came out with a course on LinkedIn about how to do LinkedIn ads. So he really is the authority on LinkedIn ads. I highly recommend listening to this episode. If you're a business owner, you've considered LinkedIn ads, maybe they haven't worked for you in the past and you've considered if you even have done them right, this is gonna give you a lot of insight on how to do it the right way. It's still going to be more expensive than traditional ads, but AJ gives a lot of great advice about how to lower the cost, how to make them higher quality, and how to make LinkedIn ads work for your business. Hey, it's Blake here. If this is the first time that you're joining us on the Yours in Marketing podcast, do me a favor. Please go wherever you get your podcast, doesn't matter where, and please review, rate, subscribe to the podcast right now, well, or after the episode, whichever works for you. We're really looking for your support so that we can build this and make it even more valuable for you. So please rate, review, and subscribe the Yours in Marketing podcast. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I got AJ Wilcox with me here. He is a LinkedIn expert, and we're going to talk a lot about LinkedIn. We're also going to get into several other things, but AJ, go ahead and introduce yourself. Let us know kind of where you're at in your life right now, where you live, what you're doing, and let's say, uh, what's your favorite ice cream? Ooh, I like it. Okay, I'll, I'll, uh, thanks, Blake. I'll start out with my ice cream. I love anything related to cookie dough. So if it's uh, mint chocolate chip cookie dough, count me in. If it's any other kind of cookie dough, we're good. So I run an ad agency that literally LinkedIn ads is the only thing we do. For the last four and a half years, I've just gone super, super deep. And because we specialize, we were LinkedIn's very first agency certified partner, which mm. is pretty cool. We get to also run many of LinkedIn's largest accounts worldwide. So I've gotten to spend a lot of money, which is fun. Um, I live in the state of Utah with my wife and four kids. And uh, yeah, I love B2B. So how hard is it to niche down so deep and ignore other opportunities? Like you, you can run ads across all other kind of PPC platforms, but what's it, how, how hard is it to niche down to only be doing LinkedIn? It was actually pretty tough because my background was SEO. So for the first seven years of my career, I was an SEO guy who out of necessity branched into Google ads, who then kind of stumbled onto Facebook and LinkedIn and was like, Ooh, there's something cool here. So, um, it was very difficult to start turning those things down. But every time that I would deviate and say, oh yeah, we can try Facebook ads, we can try some other things. There was just enough friction that I went, ooh, we're not giving the client the best experience. We're not doing our best job. Let's just return back to exactly what we know we are the best in the world at. I imagine when you started doing LinkedIn ads that it looked a lot different than it does now. Because <laughs> now you've got the lead lead gen forms, you've got even better targeting, you've got all these different things. I'm sure that the platform, not just the UI, but just the functionality in general has changed. So what was it like when you got started? You know, it's, it's funny. Originally, the platform was just utter garbage. It would crash every 10 minutes, especially with the amount of data that we were putting through it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was really hard to work with. But we had a really good ad rep internally who would do a lot of work for us and work with us. She's amazing. And then they actually ended up disbanding that whole team. So now if you're working with LinkedIn, they don't actually do any work. They're just, they're essentially a sales team. Mm -hmm. Um, But they used to actually be really useful and helpful. So as the ad platform has gotten better and it has more and more bells and whistles, more and more people have seen the value. And so costs have risen. So even though back then it sucked to manage, there were really, really good efficiency to be had. So the moral of the story here is LinkedIn, you used to be helpful. Now you're not. <laughs> That's pretty much it. That's yeah. Right. Now you're getting more helpful, but you're, you're or at least <laughs> the platform's getting better, but you're more expensive. So yeah. <laughs> got it. Got it. Well, so where does it fall LinkedIn on the spectrum of ad platforms that are the easiest to advertise on? Like what platform is, has the highest friction, most difficult to run ads on and where does LinkedIn fall in there? You know what? I actually think that Google ads is probably the highest on, on level of friction. You know, I started out there and so spent a lot of time in the Google Ads platform. And now when I go back and look at it, I don't even recognize it. So it's just, it's it's crazy. Um, I, I think, especially the new UI, I think they're trying to simplify things, but there's a lot of friction for a new advertiser there. Facebook is definitely getting there. I call it the Frankenstein of ad platforms. They started out with something really good and then they just bolted on like yep. new functionality to it. Yep. So 
it's, it's a little bit tough to know what you're doing, but once you get in, it, it makes a lot of sense. LinkedIn is super simple. There are a few little gotchas here and there that you might not know going into LinkedIn ads that could hold you up. But as soon as you get the account set up and you, you start creating audiences, it's really simple. Like, Ooh, here's an audience and let me stick an ad inside of that. Cool. We're done. Yeah. But before we get any deeper on LinkedIn ads, I want to talk about some of the more obscure platforms. Like, have you ever run ads on Twitter, on Reddit? Have you ever done those? Yeah. So uh, Twitter is especially difficult. I, I remember hitting my head against the wall repeatedly with Twitter because I could not figure out how to create like a dark tweet, a tweet within their system. And so it probably took me two hours before I was like, I give up. And then I go and ask someone and they're like, oh, it's because you didn't get permission to create a tweet. You just, you can only sponsor tweets on the timeline. So things like that are, are tough. I've played in Pinterest ads. Pinterest actually makes a little bit of sense. Cora, Cora's looking really good right now. I'm really Cora. excited about Cora ads. So yeah, that's just all of these ad platforms in, in various stages, but Google and Facebook have both set the bar for here's where functionality needs to be and where advertisers want it. So now everyone's playing catch up. So if there was a business owner out there that's like, I've tried Google, I've tried LinkedIn, I've tried Facebook, I want to try something different. You would recommend Quora above anything yeah. else. Yeah. So here's the cool part about Quora ads. They're still like one cent per click. Yeah. So if you're looking <laughs> for efficiency, you can't get more efficient than that. Plus there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with it. You could send someone to a landing page. You could even ask a question and then answer it with a really complete answer and then send people to your answer to be like, Ooh, thought leadership. Like, look how awesome I am. So yeah. really flexible at a cent a click. It's just hard to beat. Do you know the, like the volume of Quora right now? Is it even comparable to something like Twitter? Yeah, I, I think it's probably comparable to Twitter. Uh, maybe not in some industries, because I know Twitter does really well in media. But yeah, I think it's definitely worth a test. With Quora, I think it really comes down to like the subject that you're around. So if you're niched down to like a very specific, like let's say Salesforce CRM, there might be a limited amount of questions about that. But if you if you back up to like CRMs in general or B2B, all of a sudden there's probably a lot of volume. What's most interesting to me about Quora volume-wise is they have something like 360 million users in the US right now. And LinkedIn has 610 million users worldwide. So by users, Quora is like half of LinkedIn and it's still pretty new. Yeah. Wow. That, that's actually really cool. I've never run Quora ads before, but I will definitely take a stab at that because I think that that would be super cool. But I want to take a step back here before we get deeper there. I really like talking about people's careers and how that develops because I think there are a lot of people, whether they're advanced in their career and decide they want to do something else or they're just getting started, like they're the entrepreneurial type, then there's the structured career type. So where do you fall on that first and foremost? Do you prefer to have, like, obviously you have your own thing, so I'm guessing you're going to say entrepreneurial, but is there a part of you that actually mentally you, you feel better in that structured company setting? I always thought that I was going to be a company guy. My dad worked in the same bank pretty much for like 33 years straight. And I'm very financially conservative. I love the idea of just a steady paycheck, something you can bank on. And so I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. The only reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because I was fired from my last job and was like, ooh, okay, here's an opportunity. I guess there's no better time to try it out. I've always really liked startups, always loved like the startup energy, the entrepreneurship community, but never felt like I had the guts to actually go out and do anything about it. But having fallen into it, literally receiving this as kind of like an answer to prayers after I was laid off, you know? So now that I'm in it, I'm going, yes, this is amazing. Why didn't I see how cool it is to plan your own calendar and, you know, and be your own boss before? But anyway, it's, uh, you don't know what's on the other side until you get there. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's talk about your, your beginning because you, so you went to BYU and you've been in marketing the whole time, right? Like yeah. since, since the beginning, this has been kind of the path for you. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, I liked the idea of marketing. I, I'm a big car guy. And so I, I used to get car magazines and save all the BMW and Rolls Royce ads, really liked analyzing the copy. So when it came time to choose a major, I was like, well, I can always choose a, a different major later. I know I'm, I want to be in the business school. So let's try marketing. Mm -hmm. And then I just fell in love with it. It was awesome. And then after college, what was your first step into your career? Where'd you work? What did you do? And how did that progress onto where you are now? 
Well, as a student, I was working actually for the school doing second level networking support and server support and, and other techie stuff. So my brain thinks like a techie guy. And I really appreciated that, especially because I was getting paid more money than any other like on campus job. Yeah. So I didn't, didn't want to leave that. You know, it sounds silly right now. Those aren't, no, the, the, those yeah. aren't campus jobs. They're like, Three dollars an hour. I know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I so I was getting paid thirteen dollars an hour, which was amazing. I didn't want to leave that behind, but I also had these kind of unfounded fears of a college student who in the world is going to hire me in marketing if the only thing I know is tech. And you know that sounds laughable now because marketing is all about tech, but mm. I was just scared out of my mind. And then in one of my marketing classes we had a guest lecturer who came in and talked about SEO. And as he's describing what this is, I'm like tech plus marketing. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And when was so, this? That, what uh, year this was that? Was, yeah, this was in 07. Okay. And I, I went up after class to that poor man and I just begged him for an internship and he hired me on. And, and it was ever since then, I was like, Ooh, I love this stuff. And I've built my entire career just going from, you know, agency to in-house and to now starting my own agency. What prompted the switch from SEO to PPC? Because typically, for, for me, my, my background's in SEO. I know PPC, you know, but it's never going to be quite to the standard of my SEO knowledge. So why did you decide to just flip after so many years? You know, there was a big fallout from the field of SEO. Uh, I want to say 2009, uh, might have been 2010, when the Hummingbird update and Panda update came through. Mm -hmm. And I watched a lot of collateral damage of SEO agencies being sued because they did poor work for the client and got banned by Google. So there was a lot of that stuff going on. I also, I, I'd been doing SEO for about seven years and I would pitch at conferences and stuff to speak and everyone would just go, you're one of you know 300 SEO guys, like good luck creating a, a personal brand for yourself. And as I went into a, a different company where I was managing all of like both organic and paid, I started having a ton of success on the paid side, especially with LinkedIn, but definitely on Google. And I just loved how I would flip a switch today. And then my boss is praising me for the, the lead quality the next day. Mm -hmm. So because of those metrics, I was like, mm, okay, I, I like paid. This makes a lot of sense. So you make the switch to PBC, but then also you've got you're published across the web on a lot of different blogs. So <laughs> you, you, you've written stuff on SEM rush marketing land, big blogs, big marketing blogs. So I want to talk about that for a second. What was the first big guest blog that you did and how'd Ooh. you actually manage getting that? Because I think there are a lot of people that would be interested in pursuing thought leadership a little more, but they don't know how to take that step to actually reach out and land an opportunity like that. When I was very first new into creating content, I had this idea like, like you need a connection, you need something special, like, and it's a numbers game. Like how many pieces of content do you have to create before one of the big blogs accepts it? Mm -hmm. And what it really comes down to is it's all about quality. If you've only ever written one blog post, but it's amazing, you can still get that picked up. So my very first post as an SEO guy, I'm sure you understand like the value here. I was young in an agency. I read moz.com. It was SEO moz back then, but I read moz.com every single day, like every single article. And it was just my dream to have a post up on there. And then I, I wrote a really well-researched piece that made it on the moz community blog. Uh, they don't have that anymore, but it was mm -hmm. like, it was like the first step into publishing on the main blog. And after that, I was like, ooh, I mean, all I had to do was just reach out and give them a really good idea. That means any blog in the world will probably take my stuff if it's good enough. And so I started focusing on quality over quantity. Well, what does a quality blog post look like? I think you have to answer a question that people didn't know that they had. Of course, it's a great thing to, to answer a question that everyone has right now and they're asking, but someone would always beat me to the punch. But my very first blog post I wrote was all about, or that got accepted by Moz. I'd written other stuff, but um, it was about the halo effect between if you're optimizing for one keyword, how the close variance of that also rose in rankings. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just pulled my own unique research. And because it was my own unique research, people appreciated it because they didn't have to do that work and they'd link to it and you know, praise it. What does that do for your business, for your personal brand, when you guest post on sites like Moz, SEMrush? Like, is that a strategy that, that you think produces enough ROI for people to pursue compared to how much work you had to put in for it? 
I think for most people, yes. For me personally, I'm a really poor and slow writer. And so literally a blog post takes me like 12 hours to write. And that's research, that's you know review, that's all that kind of stuff. But it just became so tedious for me that sometime last year, I just said, eh, okay, no more writing for me. Uh, if anyone asks for anything audio or video related, I'll do it in a second. Mm -hmm. But if it involves me writing, I better cut out. So I do think that there is a valid return on investment on writing, but it just was so hard for me to do. And my brain just kind of rejects that kind of work that I gave up. I think most people will relate to that because it seems like the industry in general is moving more toward video and audio. Podcasting is now like there was something with from Seth Godin. He put out a blog post that said podcasting is the new or guest podcasting is the new guest blogging. I don't yes. know if you read that. And I'm like, that's so true because you're still going to get the link. You're still going to get everything you want out of it, but you just have a regular conversation and it takes an hour as opposed to 12 hours, like you said. So that's I think right. that's, that's a really low friction way to create content or if you're doing videos to create a transcription for SEO purposes. And it's basically still like a blog. So there, there are definitely workarounds, but writing a blog can be very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I've definitely been through that myself. Writing is not super easy. Oh, well, and to all those who are listening to this podcast right now, I'm sure you can appreciate this, but I just love the medium of podcasting so much because if you were to put this exact same thing into a YouTube video, and maybe someone is watching this on YouTube, mm -hmm. but you'd have to like put it up on a screen and pay attention to it. But podcasts, I just download and I go listen to them during my morning workout. And you've got my undivided attention while I'm you know, lifting weights or running on the track. And you know, what other medium can you get someone's attention for an hour straight and you know, not have any, any problems? I mean, and the other thing is podcasts, even small podcasts still get like thousands of listens per episode. Mm -hmm. If you told me you had a room with a thousand people in it who wanted to hear me, I'd fly myself across the freaking country, you know, <laughs> to go talk to that group. So I just, I love podcasting. Yeah, no, that's true. If you think about it, you're scrolling through Twitter. If you put a, a post out on Twitter, it's going to take somebody three seconds to read that. And then, it's, <laughs> and then it's done. You're no longer in their thought process at all, but a podcast you're there for an hour. That's monumental compared to where, where you usually are with that. So Let's get back into the LinkedIn advertising. This is your forte. This is what you do better than anybody else. So well, in fact, that they actually gave you your own course on LinkedIn advertising. So let's talk about that a little bit because I buried the lead there a little. So how, did, <laughs> how did that come about? How nerve wracking was it to record a course for LinkedIn advertising? This one's been a long time running. Lynda.com they've had a course on LinkedIn ads for a while. Mm -hmm. And I've always kind of had it in the back of my mind, like, I should be the one to author that course. I want to do that. And so I was kind of waiting for the old course to get out of date so that they'd invite someone else. So yep. I was networking in and I knew the, the people who were planning content over there and we were getting pretty close. And then LinkedIn bought Linda. And then I was like, oh, great. Like LinkedIn's going to come in. They're going to be like, no, no one knows our own ad platform better than us. How about we create our own training? And of course, Trainings coming from the platform itself are never good. Like they drink way too much of their, their Kool-Aid. It just doesn't come across as being good advice. They, it just turns into a sales pitch. So it took them a couple years before they realized like, oh yeah, we really should have a third party talking about this. And then we restarted discussions and uh, it went off great after that. How long did it take you to film all that? Oh, it was one week in Santa Barbara. I think if I had to do it again, it would probably only take two days. Mm. But like first day, we recorded a bunch of stuff and then the audio files got just erased. Awesome. So I had to come in the next day and do it all. <laughs> and, and then my shirt was the, the wrong color and it was creating this this like mosaic pattern on the camera. Yeah. And so we had we went shopping on day two to like go get me a different shirt. So but <laughs> anyway, days you know three, four, and five went great. And uh, I even had time to go hit the beach. So can't complain. <laughs> did you did you have to write that script yourself or did somebody did. help you? And how, how long is the yeah. script? Like if it were a blog post, how many words are we talking? I mean, I could pull it up. There's an intro and an outro to every section. And mm -hmm. I think there's something like 30 sections. So there's that much written. And then I really just riffed in the middle because I do a lot of public speaking mm -hmm. and teaching about LinkedIn. So this is the stuff that I talk about all the time. So it didn't take me many shots of just riffing on the content in between. So there's none of that stuff's written out, but you know, intros and outros took me a while. 
Do you ever find yourself talking in your sleep about LinkedIn ads? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't catch myself doing it, but, uh, <laughs> but I do notice that like I come up with some really good thoughts and ideas around LinkedIn and I go, wait, you should be trying to go to sleep. Why are you thinking about, <laughs> about LinkedIn? So th this is the kinds of stuff I, I keep coming up with stuff while I'm trying to go to sleep. It's probably not healthy, but I, I dig it. You're a madman. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, how have you been liking the new lead gen forms? Because those came out, what, a couple months ago, I guess. So lead gen forms are something I've kicked against for a long time. Here's what I don't like about them. Number one, it's really hard to get your data out of LinkedIn when people submit their information directly to mm -hmm. LinkedIn. So that's tough. And then the other thing is that when someone is filling out one of those forms, it means that they're not on your website. So you can't retarget the traffic. You can't track it through analytics. And then the traffic is less qualified because they didn't have your whole site of information to qualify themselves or a whole landing page. They made the decision to fill out a form after reading 150 characters of an ad. So for a long time, I've just said, I don't like them. I try not to use them. But over time, we've tested it into them with our clients. And about half of our clients use them exclusively. And the reason why is because they have like a 10 to a 50% higher conversion rate on average. If I told you, you know, spend the same amount of money, but I may get you 10 to 50% more leads, chances are you're going to be like, <laughs> eh, let's try it. That sounds yeah. pretty good. <laughs> but ultimately you're more of a traditionalist with the LinkedIn ads. You, you like doing it the traditional way. Yes, I really like traditional. And especially because when LinkedIn came out with sponsored content that was like their newsfeed version of the ad, a whole bunch of people started adopting that ad format and they pulled their dollars away from text ads and my costs went down on text ads and my efficiency went up. So I'm like, oh yeah, everyone, please go chase video, go chase carousel ads, go chase the, the new shiny object. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to keep making the old stuff successful. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that gets overlooked. That's that's a strategy you don't hear very often. Everybody's like, for example, IGTV comes out and then everybody on Instagram's like, all right, get onto IGTV. Nobody's on there yet, so let's take advantage of that. Meanwhile, there's some person that's going to really hammer home Instagram stories or something else that already exists, and they're going to keep crushing it because people move their attention elsewhere. But I've, never, right. I've actually <laughs> never heard anybody give the advice of just like, Hey, Beach, just keep with the traditional stuff. Don't go after this, the opportunity. Stay with, with the old opportunity. And I think that there's definitely a place for that. But I think – I may be wrong about this. Maybe you've had different experiences, but a lot of people are going to look at LinkedIn ads that don't really know anything about them, and they're going to get super scared. Oh, yeah. They're going to say, like, I have no clue what on earth I'm doing. Because Facebook ads are pretty easy. I mean – there now it's it gets like you said there's more and more functionality so it gets a little bloated but pretty easy and then you get used to google ads and after a while it's okay but with linkedin if you've never tried it you get intimidated so for a b2b leader in that situation just getting their feet wet in linkedin ads what would be your first piece of advice well i've got a good one for you Early on in our company, I, I was talking to a lot of people who couldn't afford to work with us, but they still wanted to run LinkedIn ads. So I came up with this offer, and it's the free checklist. It's the same eight-point checklist that we use to onboard new clients here at B2Linked, and I just gave it out to everyone else for free. So if, if anyone who's listening wants it, go to b2linked.com slash checklist. And uh, if you don't tick that box that says, I want AJ to contact me, you'll never hear from us ever again. It's just, just pure value. And live by that checklist. Get everything set up the right way. And then it should make your life a lot easier. The other recommendation I'd have for you is LinkedIn will tell you with your bids to bid really high. They'll even go as far to tell you as like, hey, other advertisers that look like you are bidding between 12 and $20 per click. And you just just say, screw you, LinkedIn. Like, I... <laughs> I'm not going to pay that much. And you just, you just bid low to start out with. You can never go wrong by starting bidding low because if you don't get traffic, you can always just incrementally raise your bid until you get what you need. Mm. Well, the perception out there is that LinkedIn ads to this day are still a lot more expensive than any other ads. But I'm not so sure. Maybe your expertise, you can speak to this. I'm not so sure that Google ads at this point are not every bit as expensive as LinkedIn ads. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So Google on average is like if you average every click across their entire Google ads platform, they say that they average somewhere around $1.20 per click. But of course, if you're in B2B, you're probably paying $20, $30, $40 a click. Yes. So and those are probably the clicks that are competing on you know, with LinkedIn traffic. But keep in mind that with Google, 
it's search, someone is actively looking for the service you provide. And so you can really send them right to a sales page. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying, would I rather pay $40 per click to send someone to the sales page to give us a, a sales qualified lead? Or would I rather pay $6 a click to have someone download a checklist or a cheat sheet or some other lead magnet and then have to nurture those people, chances are I'm probably going to say search makes a lot of sense. But of course, a combination of the two is ultra powerful. Is there any way that B2C companies can hack their way to success on LinkedIn? Yeah, there are actually three types of B2C companies that do a really good job on LinkedIn ads right now. Number one, it's anyone who's recruiting. So recruiting is technically B2C. If you are in higher ed, something like an MBA program, recruiting students, that works really well. And then also financial services. I know like Amex is a big advertiser on LinkedIn just because they're going to take 4% of all of your purchases that you ever make on the card. So there's a big enough lifetime value to make up for those you know, $6 clicks. But in terms of somebody that's actually selling a physical product, there's probably not a whole ton that's going to make sense there. No, it's it's hard because no one is ready on a on a first touch on LinkedIn to open up their wallet. So you need some kind of intermediate conversion to occur. And you know, if, if you're gonna pay for two, three, four LinkedIn clicks, you eat away at product margin pretty quick. I will say though, like we've worked with medical device companies where they sell an MRI machine and it's like a thirty thousand dollar purchase or a five hundred thousand dollar purchase, and that can work great. It's just you got to have a big enough deal size on the back end to make up for your initial high CPCs. Mm. Do you personally create content on LinkedIn pretty often, even if it's just messages, you know, text posts? Yeah. Right now, LinkedIn's starting to become really appreciated in, uh, in the business community. And it, I think it's because it's the easiest network in the world to go viral on. So what, what I want everyone here to do is take a look at how many people you're connected to on LinkedIn. So you click to your profile and just see that number. It might be 200 people. It might be 5,000. But whatever that number is, go and write a post on LinkedIn, just a simple status update, and mm -hmm. go back a couple days later and just see how many people have seen that post. And what I'm used to is usually between about two to three times more people see my posts than I'm actually connected to. So what that tells me is I reached a whole bunch of like two thirds of people that don't already know me. And that's exposure that I get to them. That's viral and, and it's free. That's really interesting to say in the midst of this huge decline in organic reach recently. Yes. So I, I'm not sure if you've looked at your, your metrics lately. So I post a lot on LinkedIn and it has taken a huge hit for everybody because now they've they've basically done the same thing Facebook did, the same thing Instagram's done. They've killed off organic reach entirely. It's not quite as bad. You can still get some traction. But do you think that if it continues on that path and becomes like Facebook where basically you're not going to reach anybody from an organic standpoint, do you think at that point it's going to be worth creating content and publishing thoughts on LinkedIn? I think it'll still be valuable, but not nearly as much as it is right now. I know LinkedIn kind of leveled the playing field about a month ago where organic reach went down for people who had a ton of, of attention. And I forget what the update was called. It, it made a lot of sense though, but it was people like Gary Vaynerchuk mm -hmm. who he doesn't need 2000 comments on his articles because he's not going to respond to them anyway. Mm -hmm. So LinkedIn was like, Ooh, for the top 1% of content creators, how about we stop showing their stuff all the time and we give that to some of the little guys. So I would not be surprised if yours got cut because you were part of the 1%. Uh, I was not, I don't, I'm, oh, I'm, 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 my... I'm not, I'm not part <laughs> of the 1% by any means. <laughs> Trust me on that. <laughs> well, I keep checking and, and see, cause like some of my posts will get, you know, I'll have under 3000 views and mm. some will have way more. Mm. So I think it just, it depends on if you can get people to click like and comment on your, your posts. That's how they go viral. Yeah. Well, how can you get the most value out of that when the reach starts going down? When reach goes down, I think you just need to look at it like this is a message that I can put out to the people that I know in business. When I post, I don't need 10,000 people to see it. I just need the people to see it that it means the most to. Mm -hmm. So I'm amassing this group of followers who are all interested in LinkedIn ads. And they know if they follow me that they're going to hear stuff about it. And if those people still follow me, what do I care if a thousand attorneys and real estate agents don't see my stuff anymore? So clearly we've learned a lot about LinkedIn from you, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into your 
personality, your character. So I'm going to ask you some deeper questions. We're going to get deep here. You can feel free to take his, you know, you can do one sentence. You can do a whole spiel if you want, if you need to, to answer these questions, but they're not really going to be business related so much. Bring it on. Let's dive deep. Let's get deep. What's one of your non-negotiable values? I think it has to be transparency. I've always hated dealing with salespeople, especially the smarmy ones that you know are working a deal behind the scenes and you know hiding stuff. Any sort of deal that I'm working or business that I'm doing, I want to be 100% transparent and let you know, you know, here are the pros, here are the cons, you decide. I don't want to be a manipulator. Because obviously you own your own business, so you're going to be a salesperson for your business if you, if you don't have a sales team. And when it gets to that point, what difficulties do you face there with trying to be transparent? Because you still are trying to sell them because you want to help them out and you want their money. But at the same time, if transparency is your main goal there, how does that look sometimes? Well, it was really hard in the first six months of launching the business because I didn't know if I was going to be able to support the family. Like we weren't making enough money. But at the same time, like I just understood that anytime I'm going for the sale, I look desperate and pe- it turned people off. I kind of trained myself early on to say, look, just provide value. You're not a you're not a strong sales guy. You're not a strong closer. So just provide value until someone says, okay, how much do I have to pay to get you to do this for me? If you get to the point where you have enough business, everything's good. I think it's really easy to turn down business because you can say, of course, I can close this person right now and probably get two or $3,000 from them. But I'm going to have a really hard conversation in three months when they come back and say, my product is not a good fit for LinkedIn. You knew this. Why did you let me spend all that money? So I'd much rather have a hard conversation at the beginning than a devastating conversation at the end that leads to my reputation being dragged through the mud, you know? Yeah. If you could go back, let's say five years in the past and you could give yourself one piece of advice and then you would vanish, what would it be? (laughs) Oh man. Something like invest in Google. (laughs) Wouldn't that be great? Um, Bitcoin would have been another good one. Bitcoin. (laughs) Just before I disappear, I just got to make sure like at the end of 2017, sell. Um, I I, I don't know. I I think I've done a lot of stuff in my life, right. And it took me a long time to get to where it was right. So maybe I could tell myself like, Hey, here's what you're, you should be doing. Like avoid the, the wastes of time that you might hit, but I'm I'm actually really happy with the path that I I went through to get to where I am because they were all life lessons I learned. So I, I might just tell myself like, be open to the concept of starting your own business at some point, because you'll get to. What's the hardest thing that you've ever gone through in your career? I definitely have to say getting fired from my last job because when it happened, it was totally unexpected. I had three kids at home with one on the way. And as a provider, it's really difficult to go back to my family and say, Hey, uh, I don't think I can provide for you right now. I just lost my job. So that was really, really tough to go through. And it doesn't matter for what reason you get laid off. It's always a massive slap to the face. Uh, as a provider, it'll make you feel like you're you're not a good parent, good husband, good father. But even if you're not in that, even if you're like, oh, you know, I only got laid off because the company wasn't solvent. And it, even still, it hurts. Just, yeah, g- got to get over that. Yeah. Well, how long did it take you to recover? And what was that the key motivator that got you back up on your feet? I'm pretty quick to move ahead. Like if I know what it is I want to do, I'm cool waking up in the morning and just saying, cool, full speed ahead. But after it happened, the next two mornings, I went and just went hiking by myself in the in the mountains of Utah here. I went and just got lost. There was one day that I walked like, t- like hiked 21 miles, just got lost over in a canyon somewhere just so I could have thoughts to myself and think. That helped me a lot. Being in nature is really useful having good friends around people that you could bounce ideas off of. One of the first things I did was just reached out to a bunch of good friends and said, Hey, can I take you to lunch? And, you know, just fill you in on what's going on. And, you know, a whole bunch of those turned into referral partners for me who were like, Ooh, I, I've got a good a- account for you. Let me make an introduction here. And yeah, I, I think that's how I got out. If it were deep depression, it, it probably would, would have been a lot harder. Yeah, for sure. How long ago was it that you lost your job? Uh, it was about four and a half years ago. Let's say four years ago, did you think that you were going to be doing a training on LinkedIn on how to do LinkedIn ads? 
<laughs> no, I did not think so. <laughs> I, I, I had this goal. Like, do, do you know who John Loomer is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So John Loomer, he, you know, early on put his, his stake in the sand around Facebook ads. And he was the guy that you'd go to for trainings and knowledge. And so early on, I mean, John Loomer has no idea who I am, but early on, I was like, Ooh, I want to be the John Loomer, but for LinkedIn. And actually, even before that, I had the concept of there are several ad platforms out there who have evangelists. Their whole goal is just, just simply let people know that the platform exists. So I actually kind of petitioned LinkedIn like make me your ads evangelist. And it it didn't get very far. Uh, I got (laughs) shot down by some VP somewhere uh, who would not return my emails, but I had a good idea of where I wanted to go, but certainly didn't know for sure if I'd even be, you know, if it was a large enough niche to even support my family, uh, if I was going to be, you know, taking a job somewhere a year later. Mm. What's the worst advice that you could give to an entrepreneur or business leader? Worst advice. I think the worst advice would be like, Hey man, just go chase it. Like quit your job and go, go chase what you're passionate about. That might work for some people, but man, there's a lot of risk in, in anything. I would much rather, uh, I obviously didn't have the chance because my world kind of (laughs) crumbled underneath me and I needed to to land. But, but if I had my choice, I would have built this up on the side and then transitioned to it when I absolutely needed more time to fuel it. So build something on the side. Don't take someone's advice when they're like, yeah, go do your passion. You'll make money eventually. I don't know if you will. Yeah. So owning your own business, you're in charge of basically onboarding the clients and deciding who you hire, who you fire, who you bring on, who you don't bring on. So what separates a great client from a mediocre client? With LinkedIn ads specifically, the best clients are the ones who have a really strong offer. So if you've got something like, you know, a a free ebook or a guide or a checklist that everyone wants, you could have misspellings in your ads. You could do everything wrong, but still have a really good cost per conversion. And then if your sales team is decent enough at, you know, picking up those contacts and nurturing them into conversations and then nurturing them to sales, when performance is good, everyone's happy. I I think the best kind of client is a happy client Mm -hmm. and the happy client is the one who's getting performance and that comes from having good content and a good sales follow-up. Uh, so I think that's, that's the best. And obviously it really helps if they have large budgets because you can spend and test a lot and, you know, find those pockets of success and chase after them really hard. Uh, if you're spending 10 bucks a day, you might not notice where the success was and you might not chase it as fast. All right. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions, but first I, ha- I have one final deep question. And then we'll get into some rapid fire. So the final deep question here for you, I would like you to rate your own performance right now on a scale of one to 10, but you can't say seven. Ooh, I like it. Uh, I, I'm going to go for a five on this one. As I'm talking, I know I'm getting tripped up. I know that I'm saying I'm a lot. And so if I get to rate myself, I'm, I'm going to go low on this one, but I only had four hours of sleep last night. So <laughs> uh, I'll give myself a pass. <laughs> oh, I, I think you're a 10. I actually, I should have been more specific. I guess I'm talking more in terms of your actual, like what you're doing at B2 linked. Oh, okay. How are you doing as a business owner? How are you doing in your career on a scale of one to 10 with Ooh. can't say seven? I'll probably say five again, um, <laughs> at, at least right now, because the last six weeks of my life have just been nonstop travel from speaking engagement to speaking engagement. And so for the last six weeks, I haven't been able to do client calls. You know, I've had to relinquish that to my team. I haven't been able to, to take sales calls, so we're not onboarding as much right now. So yeah, for, if I were my boss, I'd be like five, but I, <laughs> I, I hope I'm back up to 10 here in the next few weeks as I get caught up. <laughs> Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the public speaking circuit, that's got to take a lot out of you for sure. Where, where have you been, where have you been going? Like what, what are all the the destinations? I spoke at social media marketing world at the beginning of the year and that's just a massive conference. I think there are, you know, 6,000 people who attend Mm -hmm. and it's, it's the who's who of social media. Um, I just got back from, from hero conference here a couple of weeks ago. And that's the who's who of paid ads, especially dealing with Google, but also the other platforms. Uh, so I really love that one. There's content marketing conference. That's all about content creation and, and comedy, like how to get people interested in your content because it keeps their attention. Mm. That's just incredibly valuable. So all of these different conferences, 
you know, I'd love to just hop on stage, speak, and then go back to what I'm doing. But I get so much value from, uh, you know, in networking with the people there and the other speakers and attending the sessions that I end up having to put my, my business on hold while I'm, <laughs> you know, there at a conference. All right, let's, let's move on to the rapid fire round. I've got some hard, on. hard hitting questions here. We're going to go hot potato as fast as you possibly can. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Cat person, dog person. Dog. Oh, what kind of dog? I love Pomeranians, but we never got one because my wife was like, yeah, you're a big dude and you'd look real silly with a tiny little <laughs> floofy dog. Uh, but I love Pommies. On that note, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to speak to animals? Ooh, uh, language in the world. I do like people a lot. You already speak Russian, right? So yes. what other language would you want to learn if you could learn one more? Uh, you know, I went to Italy around this time last year and really liked Italian. It wouldn't be very useful. Sorry, I know this is supposed to be rapid fire, but uh, it wouldn't be Pick very useful because <laughs> there's like one country that you can speak it. But I just, uh, I, I studied Spanish in high school and Italian was just like a really pretty version. I liked it. I agree. It's it's prettier than Spanish. I agree. Uh, I speak French. I think that's the prettiest language. Yeah, but it you is. know, I'm a little biased. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite city in the United States besides any that you've actually lived in? I really like Scottsdale, Arizona. I grew up in Mesa, Arizona, so Scottsdale mm. was a little bit of a drive, but my dad and I, I'm a big car guy, and my dad and I would go on Saturday mornings and just park on the side of the road and watch Ferraris and Lamborghinis drive by. Mm. So a little bit nostalgic, but just loved, loved that city for that. I promise you are the only person on this podcast that's ever going to say Scottsdale, Arizona <laughs> is your favorite city. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would you rather have invisibility or super strength? Super strength. Invisibility would get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite day of the week? Saturdays. I, I go with a group of digital marketers here in Utah and we go hiking uh, every Saturday morning or snowshoeing if it's winter. And I wouldn't trade that time for anything. I think that's it for the rapid fire. Let's just give you a chance to talk about what you're working on here. Uh, shout out your company, shout out anywhere where you think people should be following you. And then we can also get into a little bit more on the SEM side for the B2B growth side of things. Sounds great. Uh, well, what I'm working on right now, we're, I'm writing a book that should be out in about two months. So I'm really excited about that one. We talked a little earlier on about how bad of a writer I am. Uh, <laughs> It took a lot of effort to get all of my thoughts and trainings put into outlines. And then I actually spoke them to a, to a writer who's putting everything together. Right. Uh, yeah. So that's the only way I could write a book. I'm really excited about that one. We're also in the midst of building some software. So those of you who know Google ads editor and like Facebook power editor, what it, it used to be able to do. That's the kind of tool that I'm building right now for LinkedIn and not sure if it's just going to be an internal tool or if it'll be SaaS and we release it to everyone else. But I'm really excited because we manage some very large accounts that just take a lot of our part-time folks labor. And it'll be really nice to just have that all, you know, one click and be done. And if there's somebody here listening that wants really high quality LinkedIn advertising help, where do they go? Oh, I got a good one for you. Uh, go to b2linked.com and fill out any form on the site. Just a little trick of the trade here. Uh, you're not going to reach a salesperson and you're not going to be put into my marketing automation workflow. You will be dropped directly to my inbox. And like we talked about earlier, I'm not a sales guy. So I'm not going to put any pressure on you. I'm here to help. Yeah, he's, uh, he's pretty easy to talk to. I've managed. Yeah. <laughs> I've managed so far. So it'll be good. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm not biting anyone. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming on. And now it's time to switch from a B2B mindset to P2P, that is peer-to-peer. -peer. I'm going to be interviewing people here at Directive Consulting, my peers, my colleagues, to try to find out what makes them tick, to see where they come from, what their goals are professionally, and give you an idea of what the culture is like here at Directive. It's going to be a really interesting opportunity, and maybe you'll even find people that have your exact same job title, your same position, or your same goals, or maybe they just like the same music as you. All right. So Liam is an SEO specialist here at Directive. How long have you been with the company? About the same time as I have. I think. Yeah. So I've been with the company about six months now. I started uh, as an intern back in October, late October. So so before that, take me through where you've been because your background through college was not in marketing at all. No, not even close. So let's start there and then work our way forward to today. Yeah. So uh, actually, so I'll start with, with high school. So when I was applying to to schools, I was actually looking at PT. 
wanted to do PT. I was I was obviously a, a big sports guy, as from what you've learned from me. Uh, in high school, I played lacrosse, uh, football, and soccer. I ended up just focusing on lacrosse, and with my several injuries that I had, I was you know always going to see PTs, and uh, I really enjoyed that. So going into college, I was uh, health science, looking to be a PT, and then slowly started moving to pre-med and then probably about midway through my senior year kind of realized uh, I didn't want to go to med school anymore big commitment and uh, I still wanted to test my brain a little bit but uh, yeah so I graduated with a with a bio degree wasn't really sure what I wanted to do so naturally I hopped into sales Thought marketing or sales or something yeah, just yeah. Hopped, why hopped, not <laughs> hopped into sales because it was the the job that was given to me and my parents basically we're like you know what like you need to make some money we're not going to keep paying for you to <laughs> to go party anymore so so yeah i hopped into a sales job absolutely hated it didn't enjoy the the whole making 150 calls a day it didn't it, <laughs> it, it, it didn't test my brain whatsoever so i decided to quit that job and i moved on to another passion of mine which is nonprofits so i went and i worked for the alzheimer's association for about uh, 9 months which was awesome it, you know it was probably one of the more fulfilling things that I've done with my life. What'd you do for them? Um, so with them, I worked mainly in development. So I was a development coordinator was my official title, but I basically helped plan all of our events. So our first one that I had was basically the first thing I got thrown into right away was a luncheon. So planning a luncheon would basically just entails me gathering all the, the auction items and planning for the event as a whole. And then I did a couple walks and uh, kind of like a peer to peer fundraising uh, type of, uh, of fundraising platform. So it was a variety of things, but I think midway through that job, I had started my MBA uh, and slowly realized that I needed to do something where I was using my brain, testing my brain, especially coming from a, a biology background. I was very analytical, so I needed something that tested that side of me. So uh, that's kind of when I started searching and I, I, I enjoyed my business analytics class in my MBA program and marketing kind of fits a lot into the utilization of, of, of business analytics. So I kind of just landed in a good spot. But I guess interesting story how I got uh, linked up with Directive was I'd actually heard of Directive because their office was right next to my office when I was doing sales uh, <laughs> got it. when we were in the Costa Mesa office. So the cool thing with that was I had already heard of Directive. And so naturally I was like, you know what? I have no SEO experience. I want to do SEO. Like I can tell it's something I'd be interested in. How do I make myself pop out? And so I DM'd Garrett and he sent me back a list of like 48 hours worth of material that I needed to read, um, basically a, a whole training program. And I completed it and then I applied. And when I was brought in, I was basically like, yeah, I've already finished all this stuff. Like I really want to do it. And so... That's when I was brought in as an intern in October. So, so up until Directive, marketing hasn't been a part of anything at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> that's awesome, though. Yeah. I think that's really cool because there are a lot of people... I, I personally have a couple people in my life that have asked me, hey, how do I get into that? Because I don't know anything about online marketing or SEO, but it sounds cooler than what I do now. So they ask, how do I get into that? And it's like, well... I mean, just start building a website or I'll go send you a bunch of articles, but it's cool that you can actually start making a career out of nothing at any point. So I, I think that that's pretty cool. I want to ask you some ridiculous questions, if that's okay with let's you. Let's do it. I'm all game. Well, hold on. Let's Before we get to ridiculous, let's get deep. Okay. Let's do it. You feeling deep right now? I'm, I'm feeling it. Let's go. All right. I just want to ask a couple questions that I ask other guests sometimes. What is one of your non-negotiable values? I think uh, trustworthiness is definitely one. I don't think I've ever necessarily been a on the 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 bad side of of having an untrustworthy friend, but um, I've just seen a lot of situations through friendships and through uh, relationships where trustworthiness has basically broken apart, whether it be a relationship or a friendship or um, even like a, a trustworthiness with your coach or with your teacher or anything like that. I think that's a huge value that I don't ever want to see go away because I think it's something that can help build business. It's something that can help build relationships and friendships. And so I hold that pretty pretty near and dear to my heart. I'd say that's probably number one. Have you ever been in a situation where you totally screwed up and you knew you screwed up and you were going to be held accountable and then that value was put to the test? 
uh, in terms of me like lying about yeah. my, my, what I did. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure everyone's been in that situation at some <laughs> point in their life. Yeah. I mean, whether it be like when I was a kid and I did something that my parents didn't want me to do, I'm sure there was a point where I lied to them and then felt the wrath of, of my mom and dad basically being <laughs> like, you know what, like if you're going to do this your whole life, like it's definitely going to negatively affect you. I can't really think of one as of recent, you know, I, I grew up with a, with a Navy father. So I think that was embedded into my brain. I'm going to ask you another deep question. Then we'll get into some ridiculous ones. Cool. Uh, what's the worst advice that you could give somebody that is kind of in your position right now? So somebody that's switching into a new career or, or, or you know, you're building something new as opposed to what you studied or did in the past. What's the worst advice you could give to somebody in that situation? Uh, the worst advice would to be to expect big change right away, to expect that you're going to see results in your career right away, or you're going to advance in your career right away. And I, I've been a proponent of this myself. I think just growing up, I've always placed myself in uh, in a situation where I wanted high achievement right away, whether that be sports or school or, or whatever it was. And if you're expecting a big amount of change right away and you're expecting to move up the ladder right away, it's just not realistic. So I don't know what that advice would be on the negative side. I guess the, the flip side would be don't expect too much change or, or you know moving up the ladder in the company that you want to work for, or even expecting to know everything about your supposed expertise is going to happen quickly. Because especially with SEO, SEO is such a long-term type of play in terms of your job and your expertise and all that. I mean, that's literally what SEO is. And so expecting to know everything and within the first few months of you doing the job is just unrealistic because there's people that I've talked to in the industry, and I'm sure you have too, who are le learning new things about the industry every day. I mean, Google freaking changes their, their algorithm every two seconds. So I would say that's probably the one thing that the expectation shouldn't be there for quick development. What's the end goal for you? Where do you want to be when you're 65 and retiring? Well, I guess at this point, like 80 and retiring, maybe? Yeah, I was about to say 80. <laughs> yeah, probably retire and you're, you're, at, you're at the end of your career. What do you want to have accomplished? Where do you want to be at that point? Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm one of those people who are probably not going to end working until I'm a lot older. I, I think it's kind of something that I've always been about is I need something to keep me going every single day. I need I need to be doing work. I feel a lot more value in my life if I'm doing work and I'm working hard. So I don't know when I'd retire, maybe 85 or so, but I think everyone's goal is to end up at the top and whatever that is for, for my specific department. I think my short-term long-term goals, if that makes any sense, you know, the 10 to 15 years to end up being a director of SEO or even like a CMO of a company. I think short-term, obviously, I'd, I'd like to end up being a leader at, at Directive. Um, long-term, hopefully more of like a CMO type position, a director of uh, digital strategy would be cool as well. Long-term, I don't know. I don't know if I can see myself necessarily starting my own agency, but um, I definitely think running an agency would be would be a cool situation to be in. Do you lean more on the spectrum of I'm more of a career guy or more of an entrepreneur kind of a person? So like, would you rather work in a company that's really well structured, really well run, great culture, or build your own thing? What's more of your personality? I would like to say that I'm more of an entrepreneurial type of person, but I think it's more just because I don't necessarily like doing the same thing every day. And so structure is great to an extent, which I think is what's what's good about my job right now is with SEO, you can be constantly creating new strategy through content, through technical, through link building. There's, there's constantly new things that I'm able to do. And so I think that aspect of my job is entrepreneurial in nature. But yeah, I mean, I, I think what would be taking me away from building my own agency and, and doing that type of entrepreneurial venture is starting from the beginning having to build it up. And what's nice about Directive is it's so young. And so you can kind of be an entrepreneur within this company and try and build up your own skill set and in turn help build the company as well, uh, whether that be from the intern level or from a director level. Uh, I think all of it is we're a small enough company to where you can build value from an entrepreneurial standpoint throughout the company. So, All right. Are you ready for some rapid fire ridiculousness? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. All right. Rapid fire. 
This is hot potato round. Okay. We're going to do this as fast as humanly possible. Cool. I'll try to keep up with you. Okay. Because I'm coming up with these on the fly Got for it. the most part. So we'll start with this one. If I were to go ahead and ask everybody at the office or in the Orange County office too, what they would say your spirit animal is, what would they say? I'm going to guess a lion just because uh, it's red. Now, what would you say? Probably a lion as well. You would? Yeah. Okay, but for different reasons though. Yeah, I would say, but mine's more like a, a personal thing. Like I've dealt with mental health issues in, in, in my life. And so it's kind of like a, a symbol of strength. Because lions are obviously like this big leader and, and they're mentally strong and they lead packs. And that's kind of how I want to be uh, as a person. And it kind of is like a symbol for me. But I would say people would say the same thing, but for the red hair. So it works. We're both, we're, we both have red hair. So it's a, it's it a good combo here. All right. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or speak to animals? Oh, animals for sure. What animal, if you could only pick one, would you speak to? Um, I would say probably a dolphin. I think they, they probably think pretty similar to us. So I think like communication would be interesting. I feel like we could have some intellectual conversations with dolphins. Yeah. And there's also the side of it, like how much we don't know about the ocean. Which oh yeah. Would be cool. Yeah. Most people say dog, but I feel like, you know what a dog's all about. We can, we can talk to dogs. <laughs> they, they can't talk to us. We can yeah, talk to dogs. Yeah. All right. Fill in the blank. Garrett Mergut is a great leader. Um, I think also another good one would be a crazy sports fan as well. We've had a couple conversations and he would not let me live down. Like he, he, he's going to put his point in like that. He's correct. And I am definitely wrong. And, you know, as a crazy sports fan myself, very hard to butt heads with another crazy sports fan, but I think a, a combination of the both, but great leader. I think, um, he's one of few people that's actually empowered me to ever do something entrepreneurial within a company especially when this company is his baby you know and that's definitely a a cool a tribute to have what was the last song you listened to god's country by blake shelton oh man we got a country fan oh yeah <laughs> all right what's your favorite city in the united states besides any that you've lived in philadelphia <laughs> okay so let's <laughs> let's let's visit this because you're a fan of all philadelphia sports right? everything yes okay Say we live in a world where you only get to take one sports team with you. The rest are going Eagles. to cease to exist. Eagles. The Eagles. Yeah, diehard Eagles. Now, if would you have said that pre-Super Bowl? Yes. You would have said it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Eagles. There you go. I was a miserable Philly sports fan, and I still <laughs> am. So I'm okay with all the, uh, the turmoil that our city brings us in terms of sports. <laughs> Do you prefer texting or phone call? Texting. Uh, it depends on who it's with. With friends and stuff, I would say texting, but like with my parents, I'd rather do phone calls because they suck at texting. So, <laughs> all right, one word answer. What is your real life superpower? Speed. Speed. Yeah. Are you you're fast? Yeah, I was. Uh, my parents called me Speedy Gonzalez when I was a kid. Uh, my middle name is Blaze, which everyone thought uh, for a variety of reasons. They thought I was trying to be cool and like, oh, Blaze, like you're a stoner. <laughs> that just wasn't true. But it always kind of like I, I was a speedy kid when I was a kid. Uh, my brain is like constantly rapid firing 24 seven. So it's kind of just every aspect of me is like going way too fast all the time. So I love it. All right. That is it. Cool. I hope it wasn't too bad. No, it was great. You didn't feel the pressure? No, no, no. All right, good. <laughs> all right. This is Liam Barnes, SEO specialist here at Directive. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Blake. Thank you for listening to Yours in Marketing. I'm Blake Emmel. If you would please do us the favor of subscribing to the podcast if you found value in this and tell your friends, tell other B2B leaders, tell people that need to hear about this. If you have a website, if you are in marketing or out of marketing, if you just want to learn how to build your website, how to build your business online, or if you just want to learn more about interesting people in general in the B2B space, please subscribe to this podcast you definitely will get your money's worth because it's free.